basically, you have the world, and we've got a core. We know we've got the, the core, which is molten, and then we've got this very thin crust all the way around the world, which is about the same thickness relative as an apple skin, relatively. Um, and then in between, this in between area is called the mantle. So you've got the core, the mantle, and then the crust, and we have the two types of crusts. And all the continents today, if you look at a map of the world, all the continents that are out of the oceans, they all basically consist of continental crust. So if you cut a slice through this, you would have, you know, something like that. And then you've got your ocean sitting here. This is not to scale, obviously. So this is your oceanic crust. And the oceanic crust is mainly basalt. Um, it is more dense, it's colder, more dense rock, and it's much thinner, 7 to 10 kilometers thick. So this is the oceanic crust. And then the continental crust is much thicker, 35 to 40 kilometers, up to four times thicker, and this is mainly granites. So this is your continental And so these are the two kind of fundamental building blocks of the world. And then the, um, yeah, the continental crust is very old. And that's what we've been talking about, these old rocks. We use uranium lead dating to date them. And the continents have survived and they get recycled. They get kind of pushed around and collided into each other. But basically they've survived for a very long time. While the oceanic crust hasn't, and the oldest oceanic crust we've got is only around 200 million years old. And this is because of the process of plate tectonics that this oceanic crust gets recycled and used up. So to understand that, so does, is everyone feeling comfortable with these two types of crusts? Yeah? Because, you know, my whole module makes a lot more sense, like, if this is in your head. So then the theory of plate tectonics. So plate tectonics is a theory explaining the structure of the Earth's crust and associated phenomenon. So associated phenomenon are things like volcanoes, mountain ranges being built, and these kind of Earth processes. And so this is from the interaction of these rigid lithospheric plates, which move slowly over the underlying mantle. So this is a complicated cross-section drawing, but it's the same components that I was showing you here. So here we've got ocean, and then this is our oceanic crust, and here we have a much thicker continental crust. And the um, kind of driver behind all of this is the mantle, and this hot mantle from the core heats up, and you get basically this dynamic mantle where you, the mantle is convecting and moving, and these hot convection um, currents in the mantle basically push the plates around and move them. And then the way these plates collide and interact with each other then explains lots of the phenomenon that we can observe at surface. So for example, where you have hot mantle coming to surface, you can get where the lava actually erupts out in oceanic crust, and you can get volcanoes. So places like Hawaii today is where you have a hotspot volcano where the lava is coming out at the surface. Then other places where it's called a spreading center where the plates are being pulled apart and you have hot lava coming out at surface and basically making new oceanic crust. And then when you have an oceanic crust that collides with a piece of continental crust, so the continental crust is thicker and more buoyant and the oceanic crust is cooler and more dense um, and thinner, and it gets pushed underneath the continental crust. This is called subduction. And it eventually begins to melt, and this rising magma then comes up, and you get volcanoes on the continental crust. So these, and it's this kind of dynamic interaction between these plates, and what the key thing is, is that the different types of continental crust um, you get different relationships, which kind of explains um, what we see on the surface. Guys, there's some notes down that side. The side has run out. You can grab some notes. So um, we're just looking at some general plate tectonics before we go back into South African geology.
So does anyone have any questions? Does this make sense, basically? Because it's quite important when we're talking about we're making the carp vault craton. So this craton and the, the heart of the continents of these lumps of continents. So all the continents that we have, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, at their heart, they all have these cratons, these ancient granitic kind of chunks of rock. And the South African one that is important is the carp vault craton. Okay, everyone's all right with that. I'm taking silence as a year. <laughs> okay, so there's a little movie which just summarizes this very nicely. Um. Come on, little movie. guy talks very fast, but it's the idea that our good stuff. Continents drift around the globe, periodically glomming together our baggage. Okay, so it's just a little animation to kind of pull together what I was saying. So the kind of take-home message is there's two types of crust, basaltic oceanic crust and um, granitic continental crust. And then convection in the mantle kind of moves these around and you get divergent and convergent boundaries. Yes. Yeah. They also come back together. Yes. The continents. Yes. Yes. And this has happened numerous times in the past. That at the moment the continents are already spread out, and it's been like that in the past. And then they've all moved and kind of got clumped together to form a supercontinent, and then which was called Gondwana. And then that got broken up, and then another one was made, Rodinia, and then that broke up, and we've got more or less the configuration that we have today. So, yes, it has happened in the past. Okay. Yes, yes. So, then, yes, yes, it's to do with its composition. So it's because it's just by nature of the rock type, basically, um, that the oceanic crust is mainly basalt. So this is lava that is um, being, you know, it's coming from the mantle. So we have minerals which you only really get stable in the mantle, these um, much more dense minerals. And the um, lava comes up to surface basically and where you have divergent currents the oceanic crust basically splits open and you get lava coming up on surface and making new and crystallizing and forming new basalt and so the oceanic crust is basically always basalt um, while the co and the um, because of this dynamic plate tectonics the oceanic crust gets recycled and gets eaten up under continents and so that's why it's only ever around 200 million years old, because it's been recycled. While well, the continents escape this, and that's why the continents are so much older. Any other questions? Because yeah, this is important, and I want to make sure that you guys are all coming along with me. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So 
We're zooming back into the geology of South Africa, and I don't think we're going to get through it all today, but today and on Thursday, we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to just keep working through the stack. So we've looked at the Archean, and we've looked at the greenstone belts and the granites. Then we looked at the Vidvartisrand Basin, which is outcropping here in red, um, this huge inland sea. Then we looked at the Fentersdorp supergroup, which was massive lavas covering this. And now we're going to move up through the sequence and up through time, and we're going to look at the Transvaal supergroup, which is um, represented by this blue. And up, up here, all around here, and in the um, eastern, in, in Pumalanga, the escarpment there, we're going to look at the Transvaal supergroup. And then the next thing we're going to look at is the Bushveld Igneous Complex, but I don't think we'll get there today. Okay, so the Transvaal supergroup. Um, is around 2.65 to 2 million, 2 billion years old. And um, starting at the bottom, we have the Black Reef Formation, which is a small, thin unit, which we're not going to look at very much. But then the main two groups that make up the Transvaal Supergroup are the Tunisport Group, and then above that is the Pretoria Group. So in the Tunisport Group, we get Dolomite. We're going to look at Dolomite, and then we get Biffs. And BIF stands for banded iron formations. And these are very important rocks in the geological record, and they record a major change of Earth's history. So we're going to look at those two in more detail. And then the Tunis port is overlain by the Pretoria group, which it consists mainly of shales and sandstones. So all of these rocks accumulated in a shallow basin. And this is related to renewed rifting on this Carpval Craton. So this is looking at, you know, we've got the modern outline of South Africa, and um, all we had was this piece of continental crust, the Carpal Craton, which had collided with the Zimbabwean Craton, and the suture zone between the two Cratons is the Limpopo Belt. And um, we have rifting and some subsidence on the Craton, and it gets flooded from the west by a sea. So we have a shallow inland sea, basically, um, in the center of this Craton. And then this is looking at the modern distribution. So this is what we see um, today. So this is just like a, some, a summary of the geological map of South Africa, just showing you where we get the um, Transvaal supergroup. So in blue is the Tunis port group. And the, um, we, yeah, it's called, has different names depending on where you are. If you're in the Northern Cape, it's called the Harp group. But otherwise, it's called the Tunis port group. And so those are the Dolomite. And then the Pretoria group is the, um, you know, the pink, which is difficult to tell the difference. But it's basically overlying it. And we have a smaller outcrop of these pink group rocks overlying the Dolomites. So that's where you would find them on the map today. So if we, look, if we start at the bottom and we look at the Tunisport group. So this is between 2.6 to 2.4 billion years old. And it's around a kilometer thick in total. Um, and the Tunis Port Group is characterized by the, um, there's two major rock types that characterize it. One is the dolomites, or carbonate rocks. So you have limestone and dolomite. And then the other rocks are the banded iron formations. So starting off looking at the dolomites. So carbonate is um, like a big group of rocks, which, um, you would have covered in the beginning part of this course. And you get basically two main types of carbonate. And they, limestone and dolomite are differentiated depending on the proportion of calcium carbonate. So, um, or calcium, depending on the type of um, carbonate, basically. So in a limestone, that's more than 50% calcium carbonate, and calcite is your dominant mineral. But in a dolomite, you have a magnesium carbonate, and this um, defines a dolomite. So we'll look at how these form. And the dolomites that are particularly are the most, uh, make up most of the Tunis port group are the Mulmani dolomites. And um, we have amazing fossils in these um, Mulmani dolomites of stromatolites, which we looked at in Barberton. And we have them again here in this Tunis port group. And as we discussed, they were formed by colonial cyanobacteria that um, form these enormous colonies and mounds, um, and they live in shallow water and use the sunlight to photosynthesize. Um, so they are indicators of shallow water and low energy environments. 
and their role becomes important when we talk about the banded iron formations. So this is just a field photograph of some of the Malmani dolomites in the field, um, and some people for scale, and you can see all of these mounds. These are ancient, you know, 2.6 billion year old stromatolites, which would have formed in a shallow pool. So how do we form dolomite? So these rocks would have originally been limestones. And um, we have a chemical process where the calcite, the calcium in the calcium carbonate, is replaced by magnesium. And this is um, the formation of dolomite. So it's a diagenetic process of how limestone gets changed to dolomite. And it occurs shortly after deposition, and it's related to the groundwater movement moving through these rocks. Um, another characteristic that you see in the dolomites is that this um, replacement and um, substitution of the um, magnesium is replacing the calcite, and we also get um, silica being precipitated to form chert. So this is again a field photograph, and this is the dolomite here, and then we have these harder, more resistant silica layers um, layered in the dolomite, and that's chert, which is precipitated during the formation of the dolomite. And the um, dolomite characteristically has this very characteristic weathering pattern on surface that's called elephant skin weathering for kind of obvious reasons. It's um, gray and basically looks like wrinkled elephant skin. So this is a very good tip for you guys. If you're in the field and you see rocks that are gray and um, have a rough texture and basically look like elephant skin, you know you're on dolomite, which in South Africa means that you're in the Malmani dolomites as part of the Transvaal supergroup. Um, and as engineers, this will be quite important. So this is my top tip for recognizing dolomites. So the dolomites are important. Basically, there's two reasons that the dolomites in South Africa are important. One is of great interest and kind of part of our national heritage, which are the caves that form in the dolomite. And we'll talk about those later. But the other thing that's important for you as engineers is sinkholes. So dolomite is very soluble. Carbonate rocks in general are soluble. If groundwater is even slightly acidic, carbonates will dissolve very easily. Um, and the dolomite particularly is very vulnerable to erosion. And what happens is that dolomite also forms excellent aquifers, so it often has lots of groundwater stored in it. And underwater, you get large cavities forming in the dolomite. And any lowering of the water table will expose these cavities, and then you get a collapse and you form a sinkhole. So this is a big engineering problem with the dolomites, and it's also then linked to the gold mining, which we'll, keep look, which we'll look at. So there's a photograph there of basically a massive sinkhole that's eaten up buildings and a road. So I mean, they're pretty catastrophic things that happen. And this is just a series of kind of cartoon diagrams where you've got a carbonate rock here, which can be a limestone or a dolomite, and um, an overburden. So in this case, it's clay, but it could be soil, with you know, houses and roads and things. And then basically you have the um, dolomite, the carbonate is dissolving and forming a cavity. And this basically will grow and move further towards the surface. And eventually you get collapse, where this all collapses in and forms a sinkhole. So this is another diagram, basically you know, just looking at the same thing in a different way. So here we have um, the dolomite under the surface. We've got sand and clay and houses on top. And you've got groundwater filtering down. And it's often from some sort of anthropogenic cause. That there's something to do with people that's making the groundwater slightly acidic, um, which then aids in dissolving out the dolomite. And you get these large cavities. And then if you've got a well pumping out, or gold mines pumping out the water and lowering the water table, then these cavities get full of air and eventually everything collapses in and forms your sinkhole. So this is a map, again, looking at South Africa. And what's outlined is the, um, where the Transvaal supergroup rocks um, occur at the surface. So the darker gray is the dolomites. So this is where in South Africa we get dolomite at the surface. And this is where we're getting sinkholes affecting things like roads and where people live. And the other kind of element and the, what makes this very topical in South Africa 
is that the Transvaal supergroup dolomites overlie the Witwatersrand supergroup gold deposits, and, um, which are you know, mined for their gold. And the mines will pump the water out so that they can mine. And this lowers the water table in the dolomite, which then empties out the cavities and forms these massive catastrophic sinkholes. So these are just some photos. This is from a sinkhole which opened up near Kuruman, because that's where you have out in the Northern Cape, you have big exposures of these dolomites. And there's a photograph of somebody's garden and house which is collapsing into a sinkhole. Yes, yes. <laughs> It's very complicated, yeah. So, um, and I think today it doesn't happen that much anymore, but um, in the early days before people kind of connected all of this together. So my mum grew up on the mines out near Clarksdorp and Cartonville, and it happened often then in the 50s and 60s where they were really pumping the mines out to get the water out. But I've got a little, we've, um, there's a video here, a news video. Oh. Um, yeah, this was just another, so this is another picture showing the, um, where the gold mines are. So this shape here, this is the um, Witwatersrand supergroup with the rocks of the, um, the gold bearing rocks and Velkom, Clarksdorp, Kartenville, Tautona, these are all the ver where the mines are. Um, Edenville, Evander, these are all major gold mines. And this is our Witwatersrand supergroup where we have the gold. And then we've got the Fentestorp lavas, and then above it there, you can see the Tunisport and Pretoria group. So these are, mo are often the rocks overlying, because lots of the Vidvardesrand rocks are subsurface, and often the rocks overlying them is the dolomite. Ooh, my, none of my videos have worked today, but I'll get it for you. This is a video, a news video from last year, talking about... Um, Maybe just play it like this. So this was on the news, and this is talking about another sinkhole. A major mining leak in the province, facing possible closure and greater potential to collapse. So there's the sinkhole. We don't know what will happen if you fall in there. See this yeah. Okay, so here's the yeah. Here's the um the yeah, the colours aren't great. So this is the geologist and he's pointing and you can see the the blue on the map that he's pointing to. The, this is the dolomite where the dolomites are cropping at surface. <laughs> Don't laugh. And then, if you listen, this guy makes a point about the mines. I don't know, there's the mines. I was not speaking to the mines. Geologists in the area say sinkholes like this one are common in dolomite areas. Anybody living or residing on dolomite must be aware of the risk of sinkholes. So this area as it is, if there's any leaking water pipe, if there's anything that is not taken into account, there's a high chance that the water can react with the dolomite and form a cavity underground. The Matosana local municipality says plans are underway to rehabilitate the area around the sinkhole on the M12. All right, I'm going to stop it there because the mayor then goes on and on. But the, the kind of the point is, yeah, and what the geologist was saying with the leaking tap is that that water is enough to be sinking down and kind of eroding the dolomite. Although th th that's a kind of a drop in the ocean compared to what the mines are doing by pumping the water down and lowering the water table. Okay, so yeah, this, it's a big engineering problem, you know, if your roads are disappearing into sinkholes. So then this is just for your kind of general knowledge. The other aspect with the dolomites, the Malmani dolomites, where they outcrop its surface, and it's the same process so that you would have um, a sinkhole which forms and you have these large underground cavities where the dolomite has been dissolved and the water table has dropped and these cavities become just filled with air and you get a sinkhole which links them to the surface. But then inside these cavities you get the ground, or well, these caves basically, you get groundwater percolating through the dolomite and then inside the cave these groundwaters degas and you get secondary carbonates forming, so stalagmites, stalactites, um, 
And in the Dolomite Caves, particularly in the area just north of Johannesburg, is known as the Cradle of Humankind. And the Dolomites preserve early human fossils. And this is the richest record of early human fossils outside the sites of East Africa. So this is um, the famous Mrs. Plays fossil from Stoufontein Caves. And this is um, Australopithecus sediba from the site of Malapa. And a lot of our understanding of where um, our own species, Homo sapiens, evolved from is from these South African caves. And it's an incredible piece of our kind of natural heritage. And the, one of the ways we know how old the South African fossils are is that we can use uranium lead dating, so the um, radioactive decay of uranium, which gets locked into these layers of, of stalagmite as they form. We can measure the uranium and the lead and work out how, that, how old that is, and then work out how old the fossils are. So. All right, so those are the dolomites. And then in the Tunisport group, wherever we have the dolomites, they're almost always capped by banded iron formations. So these are called BIFs for short, and they consist of repeated thin layers of iron oxide. So we have hematite and magnetite, two different iron oxides. And these are just, um, and you often get them alternating with shale or chert. And these are just some field photos where you can see these beautiful kind of red rocks, which is the banded iron. Yes. <laughs> it's all to do with the ocean chemistry in which they were forming. And you get basically um, changes in the ocean chemistry, which changes the solubility of iron. Um, but this is how you would recognize them in the field, that you get these very clear layers, and they're often red from the um, hematite. And they are found stratigraphically above the dolomite. All right, so these banded iron formations in the Transvaal supergroup are around 2.3 billion years old, and we find them all over the world where we have rocks of this age. We found banded ironstones at around 2.3 billion, and this is to do with the great oxidation event. So the Earth's oceans, and in the Archean, the oceans were acidic, and we had no free oxygen in the atmosphere. And so in an acidic ocean, you have dissolved iron, and then we've got the cyanobacteria in their um, colonies in the stromatolites, and they are photosynthesizing, and the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. And this oxygen builds up in the ocean and begins to change the chemistry of the ocean water and make it more oxidizing. And as this happens, you get the oxidation and you change the oxidation state of the iron, and this will eventually begin to precipitate out, and you get iron precipitating in the oxygen, which forms these in the, oxygen, in the ocean. So you get iron coming out of solution and you get these banded iron formations. And it will precipitate out predominantly as hematite. And eventually all the free iron in the, in the ocean gets um, used up and gets oxidized. And once that happens, you get oxygen, the kind of extra oxygen is then being put into the atmosphere, which begins to oxygenate the atmosphere. And so this occurrence of banded iron formations at around two, 2.3 billion years is a kind of turning point in Earth's history where we begin to change from very acidic, reducing oceans to oxidized oceans and um, begin to oxygenate the atmosphere. So this is another diagram, um, a plot looking at, so this is starting um, at the kind of very old history of the Earth. This is in billions of years. So we've got 3 billion, 2 billion, and 1 billion. And this is the um, percentage of atmospheric oxygen in the atmosphere. So we know during the Archean, basically, there was no oxygenic atmosphere, no oxygen in the atmosphere. This is a logarithmic scale. And then we have um, this massive increase and this kind of exponential increase of oxygen. And it's related to this event around 2 billion years ago where we have the banded iron formation and the role that they play in using up the iron in the, in the ocean which leads eventually to free oxygen. And after this, when we have um, oxygen in the atmosphere and um, oxygenated oceans, this is when we have an explosion of the evolution of life and things really change. So this great oxidation event is a major turning point in the history of the Earth. And 
Yeah, and this video will have to. So this video is the guy who was talking about the Archean again. And he's just explaining what I've been saying. nice hearing someone else explaining it as well. Okay, so in South Africa we have massive, massive and huge amounts of these banded iron formations. So, and they're very rich in iron and they are mined for the iron ore. So South Africa is an enormous exporter of iron ore. 
So in the Northern Cape near the town of Katu are massive iron ore mines and Sishan iron ore mine is the biggest one and it's produced over 2.4 billion tons of iron ore and it runs at a very high grade, so nearly 60% iron metal out of the ore, so it's incredible. And a lot of this ore, it's processed a little bit on the mine, but then a lot of it gets shipped down to the port in Saldana Bay, um, where there's a massive smelter. So that's just up here on the west coast. And there's an incredible railway line. There's a direct rail link from Katu in the Northern Cape down to Sudwana, Saldana rather. And the, the trains here can be nearly four kilometers long that transport the ore. Um, so this is, you yeah, uh, economic use, basically, of these banded iron formations. So, above the Tunis Port Group, so the Tunis Port Group, we had the Dolomites, which we get sinkholes in, and then they capped by these banded iron formations. And the banded iron formation is related to this very important oxidation event. And then the group above this, the Pretoria Group, so this is a little bit younger, it's at um, 2.3 billion years, and there's an angular unconformity between the um, Tunis port and the Pretoria group. So this is suggesting that we're missing quite a lot of time. And we've had the tilting and weathering and erosion of the banded iron formation, and then you get the Pretoria group deposition on top of this. So it's a new sequence. Um, we've moved away from having dolomites. We have a sedimentary sequence of mudstones and sandstones, which have been metamorphosed into quartzites. There's some basalt as well, and it's about five kilometers thick. So the depositional environment is similar to the Tunis port, um, that we have an ocean basin um, with kind of, imagine it would have been like muddy tidal flats, so more fluvial, more rivers, um, and there are some stomatolites, but much less. And we also have a change in the source area, so um, the way we can look at the sediments and we can tell where the, um, the, the rivers where, where the, were coming from and where the source area was. And so we have a change around this time. Um, so this is a photograph. This is um, north of Johannesburg. And um, this is Hartebeersport Dam. And this ridge here, the Michalisberg Ridge, this is the Pretoria's group, the um, yeah, Pretoria group sandstones. And here, the actual ridge that's making up the Michalisberg um, mountains are these huge, great big quartzite layers. So this is sandstone which has been metamorphosed into quartzite. And you can see that these layers have been tilted up. And then this side, we have a scarp face. You have um, the, basically the escarpment and the mountains. And on the back, you can see where these layers have been tilted. And you can see them dipping underneath. And on this side of the mountain, so looking north, is the Bushveld Igneous Complex which we'll look at next. And this is another place where you have, in the Blyde River Canyon and in Pumalanga, we have a section through the Transvaal Supergroup. So um, this is the famous view. These um, mountains here are called the Three Rondavals, and what's making up these cliffs here are the quartzites of the Pretoria Supergroup, and underneath them, it's been eroded away to form um, the escarpment and the mountains in, in Pumalanga. Down here is the Tunis Port um, Dolomites. Okay, so then this brings us to the Bushveld Igneous Complex, which is the next big thing that we're going to look at. But I think we are out of time for today, so we'll pick this up on Thursday. All right, thanks, guys. I'll see you then. Any questions? Any... There is no. All right. Thank you.